Some years ago when my youngest daughter was um, very young, uh, probably about three years old, she came up to me very seriously and asked if I would annoy her. And uh, I like annoying people sometimes, I guess, especially if they ask me to. And uh, come to find out, she was asking if I would anoint her. Uh, but she just didn't know how to say it right, and so I did anoint her, and I'm sure I annoyed her as well. Uh, <laughs> I was reminded of that story this week, or last week at preteen camp, when one of the young men, uh, one of the campers, went off the blob, kind, kind of came down the wrong way and uh, hurt his neck a little bit in his head, and went to the nurse, and was, uh, she was a little concerned, just wanted to get him checked out. He was fine, but uh, Mr. Smith offered to anoint him, and uh, asked him if he'd ever been anointed. He said no. And so he explained very carefully what that was, that he was going to take some oil and put that on his forehead during a prayer, and he's going to put his hands on his head and ask God to heal him, ask God to help him feel better and that not, there not be any, anything really wrong with him. And the boy was fine with that, but he made sure and explained very carefully beforehand so nothing happened that kind of surprised him or made him feel uncomfortable. And so sometimes we do that with young children when we're going to annoy them or anoint them, and we let them know what's going to happen so that we actually don't annoy them or uh, startle them in some way. But we also have found, I know even at this past camp, we found some teens that with some questions about anointing. Uh, what is it? Where, where does it come from? Uh, exactly what takes place? So I wanted to review that today. I think, uh, I know Mr. Servideo gave a, a, a sermon on the laying out of hands about three or four years ago, but I wanted to focus today uh, strictly on the anointing, talk a little bit about the laying out of hands, but mainly the idea of anointing, why we do it, where it comes from. First of all, the word anoint in the Bible, certainly in the Hebrew, it comes from a word which means to rub or smear oil onto something. So the very word anoint itself is to put oil on something. It can be used for more than just oil, but, it was, but it's used often for oil. Uh, it was done for the purpose of healing, setting apart, or embalming it in some cultures. In the Old Testament, we find anointing used oftentimes to confer authority to someone else. If we turn back to uh, Exodus chapter 29 and beginning verse 5, Exodus 29 verse 5, we see uh, Moses receiving instruction about anointing Aaron uh, to be the high priest. And Exodus 29 beginning in verse 5, it says, Then you, this is Moses, you shall take the garments, put the tunic on Aaron and the robe of ephod, the ephod and the breastplate, and gird him with the intricate woven band of, of the ephod. You shall put the turban on his head, you shall put the holy crown on the turban. So very ceremonial occasions, very important occasion. And it says in verse 7, and you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on his head, and anoint him. Now, thankfully, when you're anointed by any of the elders here, we don't take you back into the room and pour all our oil on your head. Uh, we just dab it. But I have joked occasionally that maybe this uh, sickness is so severe, I need to pour the whole, uh, the whole vial on your head. But, of course, I'm just joking. Uh, I have to explain that occasionally in case I, they're nervous that I actually will. But on, on this particular occasion, it was a pouring of the oil. We have other occasions in the Old Testament where individuals are anointed into their, into their roles, in particular as king. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, we see that. 1 Samuel 9, verse 27. Anointing was used in the Old Testament, particularly with passing on responsibility, leadership, authority. It was done with the anointing of oil. 1 Samuel 7, verse 27. 1 Samuel 9, I'm sorry, verse 27, 1 Samuel 9, 27. And as they were going down the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant to go on ahead of us. And he went on and said, But you stand here a while that I may announce to you the word of God. And in verse 1, of chapter 10, Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Is this not because the Lord, or the Eternal, has anointed you commander over his inheritance. 
So it is God who in, in, in reality is doing the anointing, but Samuel was the, the agent by which God was using to, to confer his will, to anoint him to be the king. We see this oftentimes, this ceremony of the anointing in the kings as they're, anoint, as they're anointed into their office. We see an example, actually, if you go back to 1 Samuel 20, 24, we see David's comment when David had the opportunity to kill Saul. We see what he called him. In 1 Samuel 24, in verse 6, uh, and he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed. But as David called Saul, the Lord's anointed. He goes on to say, um, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is the anointed of the Lord. And so it wasn't, he wasn't just called king, he was the anointed of God. And I think it gives a, an idea of how important this idea of anointing was in terms of passing on uh, leadership. Uh, if you go back to second, or 1 Samuel 16, 1 Samuel 16, we see David being anointed, uh, Samuel, in verse, 1 Samuel 16, verse 11, Samuel said to Jesse, David's father, are, are all the men here, young men here? And he said, there remains yet, yet the youngest, he's uh, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, uh, for we will not sit down till he comes. And so he sent and brought him in. Now he was, uh, he was ready with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him. Samuel was to anoint this youngest, this David. It says, anoint him for he is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him. In the midst of his brothers and the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. And so there was an anointing that took place uh, for David. Now, for David, this is when he was young, when he was a young boy. He was actually anointed again in 2 Samuel 2 verse 4 when he actually became king of Judah. When he actually took over reigning as the king of Judah, he was anointed. It says there, uh, the men of Judah came, there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. He was not yet the king over the house of Israel. It was later in 2 Samuel 5, verse 3, 2 Samuel 5, verse 3, that all the elders of Israel came to Hebron, and king, uh, king David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. So he had several anointings. He was anointed king over Israel at a later time. Now he's king over both Israel and Judah. But at first it was just Judah. But in each occasion it was an anointing. And we could go on and see other examples. Solomon was anointed as well. But this is one of the primary ways that anointing was used in the Old Testament to confer responsibility, to confer authority, and the passing on of that to someone else. We see other uh, uses of anointing in history. Uh, many, many peoples used, used various oils to anoint because of the healing qualities of various oils. We have, today we have what we call essential oils, and people use them for different purposes, different ailments, and that kind of thing. Uh, the ancient world did that too. They would anoint with different oils depending on the health benefits of that particular oil. Now, in our case, we just use simple olive oil, uh, not because of any health benefits. I think we all know that olive oil has health benefits, but we don't use it because of that. It's simply a symbol of God's Holy Spirit. We use it as a symbol of God's spirit as we do the anointing, that God, asking God to heal the person by the power of his spirit and that oil picturing that spirit. Now, the ancients also used anointing in hospitality. Uh, I was reading in the Wikipedia website under the article Hospitality. It, said, it says, anointing guests with oil... Uh, as a mark of hospitality and a token of honor was recorded in Egypt, in Greece, and in Rome, as well as the Hebrew Scriptures. It was a common custom among the ancient Hebrews and continued among the Arabs even into the 20th century. Imagine going to someone's house and the first thing they do as you enter into the door is pour oil on you or anoint you with oil. 
Uh, oftentimes it was some kind of fragrant oil, I guess, so that you smelled a little better after coming in from the outside, who knows, but that this was a common custom. We even see it in, in Christ's day. Remember, uh, you won't have to turn there, but Luke 7, verse 44 through 46, talks about the woman who, who uh, Christ said he entered the house and the, and the owner there, the host, gave him no water for his feet, but she was washing his feet with her tears, wiping them with her hair. He says, you gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. And he says, you did not anoint my head with oil. But this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant, and it would have been a very costly oil. And so it was, uh, it was common in that time to anoint someone's head as they came into the house, if you were honoring them in that way. Of course, again, we don't do that anymore. But we do anoint on the person's head. And I say that because there have been questions over the years. I've actually heard stories of people who avoided being anointed because they thought that whatever place on their body was ailing them would have to be anointed rather than the head. They just thought, well, if my big toe is, uh, is hurting, then I'm going to have to take my shoes off and the minister will have to anoint my big toe. Uh, well, that's not the case. We always anoint the head, and we have a number of examples in the Bible where the anointing took place on the head. Certainly this is one, and, and the oil was poured on Aaron's head in Exodus uh, 29, as we've already read. <clears throat> now, as far as anointing, it's interesting that Christ himself, uh, the word Messiah in the Hebrew in the Hebrew um, Bible, the word Messiah means anointed with oil. The very word Messiah. Christ was the Messiah. And the word Christ in the Greek, Christos, means anointed one. So Christ was the anointed one. I don't know if you remember Christ being anointed. You remember him being baptized by John the Baptist. But if you go back to Acts chapter 10, we have a reference to Christ's anointing. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38. <clears throat> and I'll just break right into the thought here, uh, where it says in Acts 10, verse 38, it says how God, this is God the Father, anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. So Christ was anointed by God the Father with the Holy Spirit and with power. Um, and so Christ indeed was the anointed one. He was the Messiah, the one who would be anointed. And so this concept of anointing is very important. In fact, for Christ's very name uh, to be the anointed one, we can see the importance of that. Now, when we perform the anointing, we also, uh, we also lay our hands on the individuals, on their head. So both the anointing with oil and also the laying on of hands takes place. And this idea of the laying on of hands was also very much used as an appointment to office as well. We see the anointing, but also the laying on of hands. If we go back to Numbers chapter 27, we see that in terms of uh, Moses. He was concerned about who would lead the children of Israel after him. And God gives him instructions about what to do to uh, not only anoint, but to, to uh, appoint the, his successor, Joshua, and in Numbers 27, verse 18, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, with you, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay your hand on him. So lay his hand on him. Set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation, and inaugurate him in their sight. And you shall give some of your authority to him, that all the congregation of Israel... Of the children of Israel may be obedient. So this conferring of authority was done with the laying on of hands, the laying on of his hand. <clears throat> so we see that as well, this, this idea of appointing and, and anointing, but also laying on of hands that went along with conferring authority and responsibility. <clears throat> we practice the laying on of hands in the church for, of course, ordination of deacons, deaconesses, and elders. Uh, and I remember uh, out in Pasadena when we were college and at college and uh, they had at, at our service they were going to ordain in, the, in those days they ordained different positions in the church different responsibilities in that in that particular case they were going to, going to in, ordain someone an evangelist uh, 
And they had all the elders come up on stage. Oh, I just remember they filled the stage. So many of just so many of them on the stage, and they tried to lay hands on him. Many of them are reaching forward. They can't even get to the guy because there's so many people laying hands on him. And I remember that, that scene taking place, but it was an ordination. And all the elders were trying to reach forward to get their hands on, on his head. <clears throat> but we practiced that for ordination. We practiced that for, for marriage. Uh, before the end of the ceremony, before we pronounce them husband and wife, we have them kneel and we lay hands upon them to join them as husband and wife. We are ordaining them, if you will, husband and wife, asking God to do that. We do the laying on of hands at baptism. After they go into the water and come back up, we lay hands upon them and ask them to receive Holy Spirit, just as we have so many examples of in the New Testament. But we also do the laying on of hands for healing. We see that it's not just the anointing with oil, but the laying on of hands as well. This was actually a commonly known thing in Christ's day. Um, if you go back to Matthew chapter 9, we see how common it was. <clears throat> People just expected that the laying on of hands was going to be a part of the healing process. In Matthew chapter uh, 9, and verse 18 it says, While he spoke these things to them, behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter is ju has just died, but come, lay your hand on her, and she will live. So this ruler knew that, the, that laying hands upon her daughter could, could work a miracle, a miracle of healing. And we see that in other places as well. In Mark 7, 32, it says that... that uh, they brought him one who was deaf and um, had an impediment of speech, and they begged him to put his hands on them. Begged him to put his hands up, to lay hands upon them. And also in Mark, 20, Mark 8, verse 22, um, it says they brought a blind man and, said, and begged him to touch him. So in Christ's day, in the New Testament times, it was common knowledge that the laying on of hands would confer the blessing of healing, or could confer that. And we indeed see Christ doing that very thing back in Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 and verse 40. We see Christ laying hands on individuals to bring healing to them. Luke chapter 4, verse 40. And when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick of various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed him. He laid his hands on them and healed them. I think it's, it's important to consider briefly this kind of the history in the Old Testament, this concept of laying on of hands. We see um, back in the prophet Ezekiel making a certain interesting comment when uh, it says that he was by the river Kabar and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. That is in Ezekiel 1 verse 3, the hand of the Lord was upon him. We see that in a number of places. Nehemiah talks in Nehemiah 2, verse 8 and 9. He talks about the king granted him according to the good hand of God upon me. The hand of God that was upon him. And we see Elijah in 1 Kings 18 saying, Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah. There's this concept in the Old Testament, the hand of the Lord coming upon someone. And his point was is that God is the ultimate source of blessing. God is the ultimate source of healing. The Bible gives examples of the transference of God's blessing uh, to human beings through the hands of other men, through the hands of others. Now, of course, when you have hands laid upon you, it's not, it's the elder's hands being laid upon you, but there is a, a metaphor, if you will, a symbolism of it being God's hand upon you, conferring the blessing, because uh, elders do not perform the healing. It is God. It is God's power. But that hand being upon us is an important aspect of, of what's happening, the laying on of hands to confer that blessing of healing. We go back to Acts chapter 9. We see another instance as we move ahead chronologically in the New Testament. We see in Acts chapter 9 another instance of the laying on of hands. Verse 12, this is, the, this is Saul, one who became Paul on the road to Damascus. Remember, he was struck blind. He had a vision. In Acts 9, verse 12, it says, And in a vision he, that is Saul, had seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. And dropping down in verse uh, 17, 
It, it goes on to say, And Ananias went his way and entered the house, laying his hand on him, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appears to you, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see another instance of, of the laying on of hands. In fact, in Mark's account, when the apostles were sent out on their commission to go into all the world and teach every creature the gospel, it says in, in Mark 16, verse 15, it goes on to say that they will lay hands upon the sick and they will recover. So part of their commission was to go and lay hands upon the sick. And we see that today. We see that as a continuing thing, God honoring the idea of anointing. And I think part of the reason is because we were given direct admonition for the sick to ask for anointing. And we see that back in James. This is probably the verse you thought of when I immediately started talking about anointing. You probably remember James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse, beginning verse 14, it says, Is anyone sick among you? Well, we all get sick from time to time. It says, Let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they, he will be forgiven. So we have this very direct admonition in the book of James that if we're sick, to call on who? Well, it says the elders. And so we know that, that is, it is part of the elders' responsibility to perform anointing. It's actually something we do quite often in the church. It says that the elders are to be called. Now, the word here for elders, some, some have wondered about this over the years, should I have more than one elder? Because, after all, it does say elders, and in the original it is plural, so it's a logical question to ask. Um, James is instructing all the elders on one of their important functions, to anoint the sick. It doesn't mean that there has to be more than one elder participating in every anointing. The implication is that if anyone who is an elder uh, is, has this role and can anoint the sick and perform that function. <clears throat> So we, we don't necessarily need more than one elder, but you will find oftentimes, if, we're, if you're anointed here, oftentimes we'll do it back here in this private room, you will find that sometimes more than one elder accompanies a person to be anointed, and oftentimes that's because, for one thing, we as elders uh, want to have someone present if we're anointing a lady, and not just uh, one elder and one, one lady present. We oftentimes will ask another elder or ask that maybe a husband or a friend or a family member would join them. Uh, but sometimes you will see uh, two elders just because we don't want to be alone in that way. But in that case, one will ask the prayer and the other will, both of them will lay hands on typically uh, in those cases. We, we often do this ceremony in private. Um, with just family, perhaps, uh, maybe one or two other people, but sometimes family members, and that's cer certainly appropriate. We don't do it as some major event in the church where we're gonna, going to call someone forward and have a healing up at the front, like some churches do, because, uh, you know, we, we're told not to tempt God, and that is a situation where, well, if the healing didn't take place, I guess God failed, or somebody didn't have faith. Somebody's got a problem. And it really draws attention to the showmanship of it rather than just relying on God healing in his time and in his way. So we don't draw a huge amount of attention to it as some, as some would like to do and some by their church traditions have, have done. Sometimes people ask, well, when should I be anointed? Is there, is there, are there things I shouldn't be anointed for or other things? Obviously, physical ailments, we tend to be anointed for those things, but some have wondered, what about mental issues, mental problems, mental illness? Well, we certainly do anoint for that as well. Sometimes people are experiencing problems with sleep, problems with emotional issues. Uh, we may anoint in those cases as well. We certainly have examples in the Bible when a person is bothered by a demon that uh, an anointing takes place. Uh, even, uh, even in the case of, of, of a home that maybe people feel that uh, there's a demon that's, uh, that's uh, present there, that would actually anoint the home, anoint the walls of the home. Uh, 
asking the demon to leave. So that, that, that anointing is used in that case as well. Um, <clears throat> but one thing we do focus on, and I'd like to bring out in terms of our practice of anointing, it says in, in James 5, verse 14, let him call the elders of the church. Now, obviously, they didn't have telephones back then. But the idea is to reach out to the elder uh, to be anointed. Uh, it's important that we don't consider when you're talking to one of the elders and you say that, you know, I've been sick, I've, been, I've got, a, you know, an inflamed uh, uh, ankle, it's really been bothering me. Uh, don't expect the elder to just say, oh, would you like me to anoint you? Or please allow me to anoint you. Now that might happen sometimes. It's not that it's, it's wrong, but we typically wait for the person to say, will you anoint me? That's the call to be anointed. And so uh, don't, don't take it as if the elder doesn't care because he didn't offer it to you because oftentimes an elder will wait for you to make that request as it indicates in the book of, of James. <clears throat> now, another thing in terms of our practice in the church, sometimes, sometimes people will kind of keep an eye out for, you know, I heard that such and such an elder, three people have been healed by him. I'm going to go choose that person to be anointed by because I think they have a better odds at healing than somebody else. And it really doesn't work that way. Uh, God's the one that does the healing. The elder is the one that asks the prayer and, and, and asks for that. But it's God's will. It's God's timing. Sometimes people have said, and I've heard this uh, a number of times, as soon as someone is ordained a new elder, they will want to be the first to be anointed. Because maybe God's granting this new elder the gift of healing. And if I, I could be the one that's healed if God is granting that new elder that. But again, it doesn't work that way either. God, God just says to call the elders. And no one elder has any more, quote, healing power than any of the others. It's God who does it. It's not any of the elders. So it's important to keep that in mind, I think. Um, it also mentions in, in James the prayer, prayer of faith. Who is it that's supposed to have the faith? Is it the elder? Is it the person being anointed? I think we could all agree that it should be both. I know all the elders I've ever talked to in terms of the way they do anointing, we're very aware of God's power to heal. And we certainly are asking that God would in complete confidence. We do ask that it be God's will. And if it, will, if it is God's will, and in God's time, that His will would be done. But we do know in all faith that God has the ability to heal, and ultimately God will heal. We just leave the timing to Him. But if you're coming and asking for an anointing, you should have faith that, that God will honor that anointing. Again, God's will, but we can have faith that God has the power to heal us. Now this brings up another thing sometimes people ask about. They will say, well, you know, I've got a got a cousin, they're not in the church, but they got a cousin, they're sick in bed, and would you come and anoint them? Because I think they need God's healing. And we have to be rather circumspect and careful in that regard, because, because people may not have the faith. You know, we don't typically just anoint some, another adult because someone cares for them, they want them to be healed. We will offer to pray for them, but the adults should be making the request for anointing. And there have been occasions where someone has requested to be anointed that may not attend church with us, but they make the request. And so that, you know, that's a request being made of them. It's not someone that just has a relative and you want them to be anointed. Again, it should be someone who's reaching out in faith themselves. Now that said, obviously if a person is unconscious, they've been, they're in a coma, they've had a car accident or whatever, um, and they're in the church, and we would go, and we would perform an anointing. They can't ask, but we make the assumption that if they could, they would. And in that case, we would perform the anointing for them, or if a husband asked for the wife and, or a parent for a child, that kind of thing. And we do that as well for children in the church because oftentimes babies, well, babies don't have faith. They may have an ailment. They may need to be uh, anointed, but we go on the parents' faith that God will intervene for them, and we will anoint a little child, a little baby, even though that baby's not old enough yet to really have faith. So uh, these are some of the things that we're asked sometimes. How do we, how do we anoint? Uh, what conditions? Um, I will say that sometimes people have come and said, you know, I know you anointed me last week for this, but I've still got a problem. Will you anoint me again? And we typically don't do that because the person has been anointed. Uh, 
We just are waiting for God's timing, God's will. Now, having said that, though, it may be appropriate if you have an illness, you don't know what it is, you're anointed for it, and then you go to the doctor and you find out it's such and such. Now you have more information, you have more details, you can, we can ask a more specific prayer. And in that case, we, we may anoint again because we know more specifically what the problem is. So circumstances have changed or knowledge of the situation has changed, and we may go ahead and anoint again in that situation. Um, but in terms of, of how serious something has to be to ask for anointing, it really is a, a person's personal call. I mean, I typically don't call to be anointed uh, and by the way, elders call other elders. We don't anoint ourselves. But uh, I would call another elder if, if, if I had a more serious problem. Uh, I wouldn't call to be anointed if I had a cold. But there are people who do call because they have a cold and they have other conditions which could be exacerbated by even a cold that could become serious. So if it's something that could become serious, uh, certainly would anoint, even though for a normal person it might not be a serious situation. I, when I was visiting my mother, I, I had terrible pain in my left big toe. And I thought, oh, this better not be gout. And by the next morning, I could tell it was just this place on the top of my toe had been bit by some kind of creature dwelling in the lawn. And uh, it's still there. It still hurts. I have not asked to be anointed, but if it feels like my toe's going to fall off, I probably will. Uh, you know, it gets a little more serious in that case. But we really leave it up to individuals, uh, you know, if you feel that it's a serious enough thing that you would want to be anointed. Certainly, our prayers are heard. And just because God has given us the, the blessing of anointing doesn't mean that God doesn't hear our own prayers for our own health or the health of our family members. It's just that the anointing is a, a more formal process, a more formal thing that God has given us to to beseech God for his assistance in the matter. And so it's something we do oftentimes for a more uh, serious situation. Finally, let's go back to Acts chapter 19, Acts 19, where we have an example of the anointed cloth. And it's interesting, Paul here uh, uh, has a, a, a very unique and usual miracles that were happening. It says in Acts chapter 19, verse 11, we prefer to appoint, to appoint, to anoint in person. That's what we prefer. That's what we see most of the time in the Bible. But occasionally there's a situation where it's not all, always possible or practical to anoint in person. In those cases, we will do what we find here in Acts 19, verse 11. It says, Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out. <clears throat> and so we, we sometimes will send what's, what we call an anointed cloth. That's a little piece of cloth like this that we'll anoint with oil and ask a prayer over it that God would specifically um, heal the person that's asked for that prayer. I don't, I, think, I don't think any elders today just generically anoint a bunch of cloths not knowing what they're going out for. I think in the old days in the church when so many people were writing in, that they, they did anoint just a, a large number of cloths uh, so that the mail department could send them out when they were requested. It's before we had pastors all over the place that could do these things. But, but we will anoint uh, based on the ailment that you have and, and send that cloth along with a letter which explains it and explains what to do with it, which typically would be placing it on your forehead and asking uh, God prayer of healing and thanking God. I might just mention as a matter of process that sometimes people will call to be anointed and that very day they'll start feeling better and believe that God has already answered their prayer. And that does happen sometimes. And, but if it does, we would just ask that you go ahead and place the anointed cloth on your head. Thank God for his healing because the cloth was anointed for you so that it's appropriate to follow through with the uh, final uh, to complete the anointing, if you will, even though you're already feeling better, it takes the mail service a little while to get that to you. But again, God, I think we found that God honors uh, when you request it, oftentimes, not just waiting for the cloth to arrive. 
Well, those are some aspects of anointing. Some of the questions that have come up over the years, some of the concerns that people have had. I'm sure I didn't cover everything, but if you do have a particular concern or question, feel free to let us know. But it's a very common thing. Many of you have been anointed many times in your life. Some of you have never been anointed. And that's a blessing, too, I guess, to have that kind of health. But it is a, a real blessing from our Heavenly Father that he's given us a more of a formal way to beseech him uh, have his hand figuratively, if you will, laid upon us to have that oil of the Holy Spirit, uh, symbolizing the Holy Spirit, to be placed upon our heads and asking God formally to heal us. And as, as we go forward, I think we, we will be continuing because we continue to see God's hand in healing, both in both anointing and anointed cloths. And so it's something that God has continued to honor. So I hope that helps answer any questions you might have and helps us have a, an appreciation for the fact that God is the God who heals. And we can truly have faith, and even in being anointed, that God will heal us.